Welcome back. We are at lecture 44. Uh, this in-class group of brilliant students took their test on Friday. Uh, today is Monday, so we are, um, I hopefully we're not in mourning over that. Uh, I've heard a few comments about it, but I don't think that it uh, knocked anybody's feet out from under them. Uh, that was not the intention. Um, I'll have a little bit of grading time today, but most of my grading time probably this week will be on Tuesday. So I'll try to get these back to you by Wednesday. Uh, if I get some graded, I'll return what I have graded tomorrow. But um, <clears throat> Wednesday would be more realistic. Uh, we will continue Chapter 8 with uh, more convergence tests. You have that summary sheet. So we have moved from the front of the summary sheet to the back of the summary sheet. We've just gotten started with the limit comparison test. By the way, there was one of those on the test. Um, you could try the comparison test, but it, the denominator was larger and it needed to be smaller in order to compare it to an existing divergent series, but it was kind of, it was close, close enough to then bounce to the limit comparison test. Can't remember exactly the problem. 1 over 3n plus 2, I think. So the plus 2 meant that the denominator was larger, therefore the value of the term was smaller and it needed to be um, larger in order to diverge. All right, so we will encounter, um, not necessarily for the first time, but at least as far as tests are concerned, uh, convergence tests for alternating series in 8.4. Um, we'll look at um, another version of the harmonic called an alternating harmonic. Different kind of decision as far as convergence. Uh, what else do we have? We have absolute convergence. If a series converges absolutely, that means that not only does the alternating version converge, but the non-alternating version also converges. So, in other words, it doesn't matter if it's alternating or not. It's absolutely convergent. And some of them are that way. Others of them, the alternating version converges. The positively termed series that is paired with it diverges. So it is not absolutely convergent. And I don't know if we'll get to ratio test today. That's realistically probably what we'll do in here tomorrow is take our first look at the ratio test and under what conditions we get a conclusion and when does the test itself fail. So we are in chapter 8, section 4. Um, why don't we just call it other convergence tests. <coughs> And we'll just kind of continue to add convergence tests. And also, uh, before we finish, we'll get some power series and then certain types of series called McLaurin series and Taylor series, determine when they converge, and then applications of those. And then we'll take a summer vacation. How's that sound? Because that'll be the end of chapter 8. Um, Okay, alternating series. So what do they look like? You will see a term that looks like this in there. It'll be to the n power, possibly. And then we'll have something else in here. Let me just say it's right now some description of how to get to the nth term. If we were expanding this one, would the first term be positive or negative? Negative. Negative? Because negative 1 to the n. Uh, I don't think I want the first term to be negative. I want the first term to be positive. How could I correct the description of how to arrive at the nth term? Starting at zero. We could start it at 0, or we could just 
change that up one or down one to get the value we want to make this start at a positive. So do pay attention to the exponent because it'll tell you if it starts at a with a positive term or a negative term. And we know from there they alternate. So the first term here would be positive a sub 1, whatever a sub n is, it'll vary from problem to problem. And so on. So we have this alternating series. We should not expect alternating series to behave the same way that the series would behave if the signs were not alternating. Obviously, it's going to make a big difference into how these terms add together. This is one of the easier ones. Uh, the alternating series test. In order for an infinite series of alternating terms to converge, two things have to be true. The n plus first term, and let's just say this is for the way it's written out in the book. So the n plus first term, forget the alternating sign part of it. That's taken care of here. Just the part other than the alternating sign is smaller than its predecessor. So in other words, it is decreasing. And it's technically not just decreasing, it'll be ultimately decreasing. So if the first couple terms kind of bounce around, one's larger, one's smaller, uh, again, disregarding the positive and negative signs. We're talking about the magnitude of the term. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but ultimately, the thing must be decreasing as we go. And if you go way out to the right, the limit of the nth term as n approaches infinity is zero. That's it. If those two conditions are met, then the series is converted. So it's got to be ultimately decreasing in magnitude, the magnitude of each term, disregarding the plus or minus sign. And then eventually the nth term has to get closer and closer to zero. So let's take an alternating version. Of an old friend, harmonic series. We know the harmonic series, when it does not alternate in sign, diverges. We've seen that a couple different ways, probably well, three ways. We did a grouping of terms, and we could group the first one, the second one, the next two, the next four, the next eight, the next 16. Each time it was greater than or equal to a half, we integrated it, it diverged, and we kind of categorized this as a p series, and one over n to the p, and p was one. So we had three good reasons why the harmonic series diverges. Now we have an alternating harmonic. What's it look like? What's the first term? One. One. Okay. One. It's a Monday. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> get it. Get it moving a little bit. Negative one half. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of glad to be back at school and work because I, all I did was dig holes and plant bushes and plant trees this weekend. So this is, this is wonderful. I, I like being here. This is a safe and uh, much more kind environment. What's the next term? Negative. Negative. Half. Half. Now we've got it going. What's the next one? 
positive one-third minus one-fourth and so on. So it is harmonic, but it's alternating in sign. What do you think? Converges or diverges? <laughs> it's going to converge. So our first part of the alternating series test is the, I'll go ahead and write it out. You don't have to write this out. So if we look at the n plus first term, disregarding the alternating sign, well, the n plus first term would be 1 over n plus 1. Is that less than or equal to 1 over n? It is, right? Larger denominator, smaller in value. So that's a true statement. Is that true? <coughs> Does the value of the nth term as we move way out to the right as n approaches infinity, is it disappearing to zero? That's true. So the alternating harmonic series is convergent. This, this might be the wake up we need here this morning. Any guesses the value to which it converges? It does converge. We just verified that with this two-part test. That's, that's a little tricky. So let's look at some sequence of partial sums. The first one, I can do that even on a Monday. Sum of the first one terms, that would be one about the sum of the first two terms. One half. Sum of the first three terms. So we're just adding on this one, right? So it'd be a half plus a third, which is five over six. Some of the first four terms. So now we're going to take this one and get rid of one fourth, right? So what's five over six minus one fourth? How many? Seven twelfths. Let's see if we see anything happening. So the sum of the first one term is one. Probably too much, right? That's probably more than the actual sum's going to be. So then we subtract a half, and the sum of the first two terms is a half. That's probably not enough, meaning that we probably did what? We probably subtracted too much. So this was too much. This was not enough. So when we get something that's not enough, what do we do? We add something back in. Guess what? We add too much back in. So this is probably too much. So because now it's too large, what do we do when we incorporate the next term? We subtract some away. Guess what? We subtract too much away. That's the way the whole sequence of partial sums goes. This is too much. This is not enough. We add in the next term. It's too much. We subtract some away. It's not enough. So we continually kind of trap where the actual sum is. It's somewhere between one and a half. Now it's somewhere between a half and five sixths, somewhere between five sixths and seven twelfths, and you continue that process. That's pretty much how all alternating series work. Uh, let's take a look at another one to try to do a convergence or divergence test, and then we'll look at kind of how we approximate sums of infinite geometric series.
So, does it converge or does it diverge? So again, ignoring the alternating signs, what would be the n plus first term? Two to the n plus one, five to the n plus one, plus three, that's the n plus first term in magnitude. The nth term is that true? And if so, how would you kind of talk through that one? <coughs> how would you justify? Okay, so the both got larger. Didn't this numerator get larger? By a factor of two, the denominator got larger in essence by what? A factor of five, right? So is that enough to convince you that it's smaller than two to the n over five to the n plus three? The plus three is kind of irrelevant in this problem. Kind of tells us where we start with the position of the denominator, but as far as determining larger and smaller, it doesn't have anything to do with that. So multiplication by two up here and multiplication by five down here, the denominator got larger faster than the numerator. That makes it a smaller fraction. So that is true. Might have a problem here. Does the value of the nth term disappear to zero as n gets larger and larger and larger? No. So eventually, the value of the positive terms are going to get closer and closer to what? What is the answer to this? Two-fifths. Two They're going to get closer to positive two-fifths. The negative terms are going to get closer and closer and closer to negative two-fifths. But we need for them to disappear in order for this particular series to converge. They don't. Therefore, this is divergent. This, um, truthfully, I don't know about I wanted to make sure we looked at an alternating harmonic. I, I think that's in the book. I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, this is a problem that I know for a fact is in the book. Um, the first part of this is a little tricky to deal with. So I want us to look at a procedure of how we can determine if the series is ultimately decreasing, which is part one of this two-part test. So again, we're, we're ignoring, I mean, we acknowledge that it is alternating. It is, and then we kind of set that alternating piece aside in order to do the test. That might be a little tricky to deal with. If ever you're trying to determine if the function associated with the nth term description is in fact decreasing, I mean this is a calculus class, how could we use calculus to determine if in fact the thing is decreasing? Take the derivative and it should be beyond some number, 2, 5, 11, 17, beyond that point it should be negatively signed, right? So the function associated with this, and I'll put some question marks because that may not be quite as clean as the one we looked at before. So this is always a weapon. Take the derivative, see if in fact the derivative is negative for some point in time 
forward. So denominator times derivative of numerator minus numerator times derivative of denominator all over denominator squared. Uh, what do we get out of that? Two x to the fourth plus two x minus what? Three x to the fourth? Does that look right? So we've got some x to the fourth terms, two of them minus three of them, so we've got minus one. And in the numerator, we could factor out an x. So how do we go from here to establish when this first derivative would be negative, because we want to make sure it's decreasing. Are there any obvious critical values of the first derivative? X equals zero. We don't really care what happens on the other side of zero, right? Because these are, n is the number of terms, so x is the number of terms. So x equals zero is a critical number. Where do we get another critical number? Cube root of two. Cube root of two. <coughs> so we would set each factor in the numerator equal to zero. We could set each set the denominator equal to zero because the derivative could be either zero or undefined. I think we're going to get a negative value down there, so that becomes irrelevant. So what do we have here? Cube root of two. So we could do a number line test. Isn't the denominator always positive? Right? So we don't really need to plug values in there. Uh, and we don't need any values over here to the left of 0 because x is the number of terms. So let's see what happens between 0 and the cube root of 2. What's the cube root of 2? 1.26 about. So we could put in 1, right? If we put in 1, that's positive. That's positive. Denominator is positive. So the derivative is positive. So in that vicinity of this curve, of course, we don't have a curve. We don't have all those points. We don't have a continuous set. We just have dots. But in that area, the curve is increasing. How about larger than the square root of 2? Well, we could put in 2. That's positive. That's negative, right? We put in 2 for x. That term is negative. So every other term is positive, that term is negative, which means from that point, right, because there are no more critical values, to the right of 2, this thing is decreasing. So is it an ultimately decreasing curve? This verifies that it's ultimately decreasing. So from the square root of 2, which for us is 2 and larger, so from the second term onward to the right, this thing is decreasing. So this function is decreasing. Therefore, the series, not the alternating part, but the just the size of the term, so the series in magnitude term by term, is also decreasing. So back to this, is this a true statement? Apparently it is, okay? Although it may not always be an easy one to try to reason through in this form, if that is not easy, 
go to the first derivative, verify using the first derivative that the curve is, in fact, decreasing. All right, that's part one. It is ultimately decreasing. And the second part is the limit. Is that equal to zero? Yes. That's true. Okay. Not <coughs> anything real complicated there, but the first piece, um, you can always resort to <laughs> to calculus to validate that it is, in fact, ultimately decreasing. Uh, if you have to kind of say by what test, well, by the alternate alternating series test. That's what this is. And it only works for alternating series. All right, the rest of this for alternating series deals with how is it that we approximate the sum and it will be approximate. It's not like infinite geometric series where we find the first term and we find the ratio, first term over one minus ratio. That is exactly the sum of those terms all the way out to infinity. So we're going to approximate. Um, let me read the wording that's in the book. Actually, let me show you this first. And then I'll read the wording in the book. Uh, should have put this up here before, but I think we've we've done this. So here is the alternating series test. Notice their description of the nth term, negative 1 to the n minus 1. That's okay. That just starts the series out with a positive term. So they alternate. The value of the term, the magnitude of the term is b sub n, which is always positive regardless of the final outcome of that alternating series. So there's our first test. Is it ultimately um, I guess we could set not necessarily for all n, right? But for n beyond a certain point so that all the rest of them are in fact decreasing. So we've done that. So how are we going to approximate the sum? So the alternating series estimation theorem. So it's got to converge, so it's got to pass this test and this test. So this is the remainder, which we decided earlier in the text was really an error associated with the sum of adding the first n terms together. Notice it's absolute value. So we don't know if we have too much or too little, but we're off by that amount. So that's the difference in absolute value between the actual infinite sum and the sum of the first n terms. You're not going to get one that's easier than this as far as determining error. What is that? So what is going to be the difference between the actual sum all the way to infinity and our sum that we added together up to the nth term? What is that? Isn't that the n plus first term, right? So I don't know if this says this to you, but it certainly says this to me. The error, or remainder, is actually less than or equal to. So here's an upper bound for the error. All we have to do is pick off the next term. 
we added the first 11 terms together, how far off might we be? The value of the 12th term. We added the first 22 terms together, how far off might we be from the actual sum? The value of the next term, which is the 23rd term. So all you have to do is basically look at the next term and you know how far off you might be in the, in the maximum sense, in the worst sense. We don't know if we've got too much or too little. That's not our issue to decide. The issue is how far off might we be. The proof of that is basically rooted in the fact that when you take the positive term, let's say is the first term, and you throw in the negative term in all alternating series by subtracting something from the previous partial sum, you overcompensate for where the actual sum actually is. So we had one, we subtracted a half, we ended up with a half. The actual sum was somewhere in between. We under the actual sum, what do we do? We add something back in, one third, lo and behold, we add too much back in. Every alternating series progresses in that fashion. There's a nice diagram on page 587 that more or less explains that without numbers. But we've already seen that phenomenon in numbers. They've got letters on that page, but it's the same thing in diagrammatic form, that you gradually converge between your two most recent values, you gradually converge on the actual sum with these alternating series. The wording in the book is really kind of cruel, so I don't use that wording. The next theorem says that for series that satisfy the conditions of the alternating series test, so we've got to make sure it converges, the size of the error is smaller than b sub n plus 1. We have that. So I think it's pretty kind in wording to this point, which is the absolute value of the first neglected term. I just don't like to use that. It just sounds so, kind of cruel that you're neglecting that term. So I'd like to keep it a little more positive that it's the next term. It wasn't neglected. It just happened to be the next one in the series. So I don't like to use neglected because it just I'm afraid it might hurt its self-esteem and it would just be sad. So I won't use neglected term from this point further. It's just the next term. So we want to, sorry, that probably is not good for a Monday. Maybe that's good for later in the week. But um, basically, the next term. We have the sum of the first six terms. We add them together. We take a calculator. We get a common denominator. However we add them together, we know this. What's the error associated with the sum of the first six? It would be b sub 7, which is the absolute value of the seventh term, the next term. Actually, it's the upper bound for the error. The error is actually smaller than that, but that would be the error at its worst, so to speak. So let's take our, our alternating harmonic. We know it converges. We've already verified that. So let's say that we want, and I'm just going to kind of make something up. Let's say we want the error to be, uh, let's not approach it that way. Let me pr approach the second example that way. Let's say the sum of the first, I did this, six terms up here. So we're going to stop it. It's not an infinite series. It's truncated at n equals 6. 
Now we added this up to what? Some of the first four a couple minutes ago. What did we get? Seven twelfths. Thank you. So now we want the sum of the first five, so we would do what? Take the sum of the first four and add in the next one, <coughs> which would be one-fifth. What's seven-twelfths? Plus one-fifth. Nineteen sixty. Nineteen sixtieths? I think so. Does that sound right? Nineteen? Wouldn't we have to multiply here by five and here by five? Here by twelve and here by twelve. So there's thirty-five, forty-seven sixtieths. And if that's, I'm sorry, that's not the sum, that's the sum of the first five. We want now the sum of the first six, which would be 47 sixtieths plus the next term. What's the next term? Minus, Minus one-sixth. One yeah. 37. So 37 sixtieths. 37. As a decimal, what is 37 sixtieths? Okay, and we don't know what level of accuracy that is at this moment, but now let's address that. This is not the exact sum. What is the so-called maximum error for this sum? And by the way, do you think it's an underestimate or an overestimate? Under. Under, because we just subtract it, right? We subtracted too much is the problem, so we're under the actual sum. So what about this r sub n in this problem? So the difference between the actual sum and what we now have is the sum of the first six. Well, what's the size of the next term? What would it be? We just added, added in a negative one-sixth. The next term is one-seventh. What is one-seventh? One, four... Point one four two nine. Two nine. So that's our error at the worst. Actually, our error is smaller than that. So we're not actually, even though we added together six terms, this is not a great approximation. Why is it not a great approximation? Because this series kind of goes kind of slowly from one sixth, which is what point one six, right? Repeating to one seventh which is 0.1429. So it, because it plods along so slowly, we'd have to add together a lot of terms to get a pretty good level of accuracy. But at least we know where we are. We know we're off by, at most, that amount. Let's take a little different approach to this problem, where we are kind of handed a level of accuracy. Probably need some calculator help on this one. So we want a sum that is accurate to three decimal places. What's this look like? What's the first term? One. 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 Next term? It's negative, right? They do alternate. One eighth. One eighth. See the difference? The, the other series, they weren't changing that much as you work your way to the right. We're getting a significant change as we're working our way to the right. <coughs> yeah. 
So if we wanted a sum, let's say we wanted the sum of the first four terms, wouldn't we be off by, at the most, 1 over 125, according to that alternating series estimation theorem? That's not three decimal places of accuracy yet, is it? What's the next one? Uh, 6 cubed, 36 times 6, 216. Does that sound right? I think we're there yet? Three decimal places of accuracy? What is 1 over 216? 0.0046. Probably not there yet, right? Because we've still got something occupying that third decimal place. We want it to not affect the third decimal place. Next term. 1 over 343. What's 1 over 343? 0 0.0029. 0 0.0029, probably still not there yet. We need to keep going. So that's 1 over 6 cubed, 1 over 7 cubed, 1 over 8 cubed. What's 64 times 8? Okay, we're getting pretty close, right? So, so far we've got the sum of the first eight. And what's the next one? <laughs> and what is 1 over 729? So we want, what, nothing there? Do we have to have nothing there that's going to affect this accurate to three decimal places? That's a, that's a good question. If you have one there, would yeah, that be okay? If we had one there, we'd be all right. Yeah. What about other, another number occupying this position? <laughs> Well, if it went from 2 to 0 being in the next place, that would be okay, too. So we want accuracy to three decimal places. <coughs> so we could have a 1 there and be okay? As long as the next number isn't... <coughs> Excuse me. Where are we right now? Point oh oh one three. <coughs> Isn't that one? <coughs> Excuse me. Isn't that one going to affect the third decimal place, though? It is, right? <coughs> I really think we need to keep going until we don't have an occupant of that place. What's the next one? Sorry? One over a thousand? We're about to end this class a little early. Sorry. So we have how much? <coughs> so what's the next one? I think we're good there, right? So where are we here? Zero, zero, zero. <coughs> what? Seven. 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 So if we could add the first 10 terms together, I would recommend a calculator rather than get a common denominator like we did before. <coughs> the sum of the first 10 terms should be within this amount of the actual sum all the way out to infinity. We're actually at a good stopping point. Since I can't stop coughing, we will uh, resume at this point tomorrow.